Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfect Snails, where medicine makes perfect sense. We continue our bleeding and coagulation playlist. In previous videos, we have talked about vitamin K deficiency, liver disease, hemophilia. Today, it's time for disseminated intravascular coagulation or DIC. It's gonna be such an epic video, so let's get started. There is no better way to start a video than with a clinical vignette. A 39-year-old female, Gravita 2, Para 2, has just delivered a baby. Several hours later, she started experiencing severe SOB, which stands for shorts of breath, because I'm a good guy, I do not curse. Cyanosis, hypotensive shock. Chest auscultation was positive for bilateral wet crackles. The patient started coughing up pink frothy sputum. She began to bleed from her mouth, nose, eyes, ears, vagina, anus, and from the surgical wound. The question is, what's the most likely diagnosis? If you are able to answer this question correctly, I'll be so happy. If you do not, it's never too late to drive for Uber. This could have been your Aunt Sally. What would you say then? Oh, I didn't study that in medical school. Do you think she cares? Our professor told us to ignore this area because we had a global pandemic in 2020 and we were not able to study hard. Wah. Call the wambulance. You either get your head out of your sphincter or get out of this honorable profession. Sorry, I'm just messing with you because I demand excellence. Here is another case for you and then we'll answer them both together. A 55-year-old male presented with severe sorts of breath hypotension. He has a history of an untreated, complicated UTI caused by E. coli. So, SOB, hypotension and complicated UTI. What could possibly go wrong? His temperature is 40, heart rate is 160, blood pressure is 87 or 57. Oops! Respiratory is 26. Oops! Oxygen saturation is 88%. Dad gummit. On physical exam, there was a tachypnea, intercostal retractions, and cyanosis. Chest auscultation was positive for bilateral wet crackles. The patient starting coming up pink, frothy sputum. PaO2 to FiO2 ratio was less than 200. He began to bleed from his mouth, nose, eyes, ears, tip of the penis, and anus. What's the most likely diagnosis? Let's start by answering the first case. Clearly, this is an amniotic fluid embolism. You have shorts of breath, cyanosis, hypotension, bilateral with crackles and pink frothy sputum. This is pulmonary edema. And then it's complicated by bleeding from every orifice and bleeding from surgical wounds, which is DIC. So amniotic fluid embolism and DIC. I could have made the question easier by telling you that she had placental abruption. So here you have it, your diagnosis, an amniotic fluid embolism complicated by DIC. What is the most common cause of death? DIC, it's not the amniotic fluid embolism. How do the amniotic fluids cause DIC? I'll tell you, because it releases tissue factor into the circulation. Tissue factor activates the extrinsic pathway, and then the common pathway, you have fibrin. After this, the fibrin will trap the platelets. You consume all of your platelets and coagulation factors, and you die. Also, the amniotic fluid embolism contains fetal antigens, which can lead to an anaphylactic reaction and cardiorespiratory collapse. Let's answer the second case. UTI, it's complicated and untreated, led to septic shock. Look at these SERS criteria. And you have a source of infection. So you have sepsis plus a source of infection, and then you have a septic shock, which led to ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and that's why we have hypotension and tachypnea, shorts of breath, and the PaO2 to the FiO2 ratio is less than 200, this is ARDS, oxygen saturation is low, this is ARDS. Moreover, intercostal retractions and cyanosis point towards ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And then it's complicated by DIC. So, on day one, the patient had septic shock. On day two, ARDS. On day three, DIC, a classic clinical scenario. Mediocre doctors will only catch this. Good doctors will catch this and this. Excellent doctors will predict this, this, and this. Disseminated intravascular coagulation. What does disseminated mean? All over the body, bleeding from every orifice, bleeding from every scratch, bleeding from every surgical wound. Intravascular, the problem is inside the freaking vessel. Coagulation, there is thrombosis, but do not be fooled. After thrombosis, you consume all of your platelets and coagulation factors, and then you bleed. So we have coagulation and bleeding. 
Let's answer the question of the previous video. You have two patients with simultaneous thrombosis and bleeding together. Patient A, disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. Patient B had accelerated intravascular coagulation and fibrolysis, which is AICF. How can you tell the difference? How can you distinguish between them, even though both of them have low plate count, prolonged bleeding time, prolonged PT and PTT? Here is how you tell the difference, doofus. DIC, the D-dimer is severely prolonged, like extremely prolonged. And AICF, oh yeah, but not so much. Factor 8 is severely compromised and consumed in the freaking DIC, but in AICF, it's actually high or normal. AICF is a complication of liver disease. If you have watched my bleeding and coagulation playlist since the beginning, you know that I've talked about TTP before. In TTP, you had a problem with the von Willer brand factor. Multimers, they precipitate and they cause platelet microthrombi. The thrombus only had platelets. Oh, and then the red blood cell got sheared and chestocytes. You know the story, right? However, in DIC, the thrombus contained not only platelets, but platelets plus fibrin. Coagulation factors, baby primary hemostasis and secondary hemostasis, and then fibrinolysis. And then you consume all of your coagulation factors and all of your platelets, and then you bleed. And of course, schistocytes can happen. And that's why TTP had low platelet count, prolonged bleeding time, because the problem was only platelet. However, PT and PTT were normal. Why? Because there was no activation of the coagulation casket. However, in DIC, we have the platelets and the coagulation factors, and that's why platelet count is low and therefore bleeding time is high. PT and PTT are high because we had problems with the coagulation factors. D-dimer is high, FDP is high because we have active fibrinolysis as well. These are the steps of hemostasis normally. In DIC, where are the problems? Number two, number three, and number four. Since I have problem in primary hemostasis, platelet count will be decreased and therefore bleeding time will be prolonged. PT is prolonged. PTT is prolonged. How about TT? Also prolonged. This is extrinsic pathway. This is intrinsic pathway and this is the common pathway. How about fibrolysis? Yeah, I have overactive fibrolysis. Therefore, fibrin degradation products will increase in the serum and so will the D-dimer. Primary hemostasis, is it affected? Yes, because the platelets are consumed inside the fibrin microthrombus, inside the vessel, that's why it's intravascular. And then the coagulation cascade. In DIC, we have tissue factor activating factor 7, which is extrinsic pathway activating tin and 5, and then thrombin, and then fibrin. Okay, and then we will consume all of these factors and we will cause fibrinolysis, will destroy the fibrin. And now we have consumed all of the coagulation factors and the platelets, we will bleed. We start with coagulation and then we bleed. So please do not be fooled by the name DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. It's not only coagulation, baby, it's coagulation and bleeding. And that's why DIC is a thrombohemorrhagic disorder. Love it. I mean, I hate it. These are your coagulation factors, but in DIC, they have been consumed. It's over. Primary hemostasis versus secondary hemostasis. Which one gets affected in DIC? Both. And that's why you have abnormal lab results here and here. You have superficial bleeding and deep bleeding and bleeding from every orifice, bleeding from every scratch, bleeding from every surgical wound. Signs and symptoms. Superficial bleeding, deep bleeding, and then bleeding from every orifice, bleeding from every wound, bleeding from every scratch. You need to memorize this. I mean, get your head out of your orifice. My favorite part of the lecture, let's bust some myths. Myth number one. Oh, thrombocytopenia is the same thing as increased risk of bleeding. This is stupidity on steroids. Myth number two. Thrombocytosis is thrombophilia. This is wokeness on warfarin. Myth number three. DIC has C, coagulation. Therefore, it only has thrombosis. Really, are you fooled by a name? Honestly, if you are fooled by a name, you are as naive as the B lymphocyte before it recognizes the antigen. Myth number four, DIC, therefore, increased D-dimer will confirm the diagnosis. This will only confirm your stupidity. Wake up. Myth number five, DIC, if I'm not sure, normal fibrinogen level in the serum will exclude the diagnosis. Your mama probably had too much martini in the first four weeks of gestation. I don't blame you. So now the truth shall set you free. Thrombocytopenia is not necessarily bleeding. I could have low platelet, let's say 120,000, or even 100,000, or even 90,000, 90, 
and then I'm absolutely fine with no clinical symptoms whatsoever. Number two, thrombocytosis is not the same as thrombophilia. Just because my platelet count is high doesn't necessarily mean that I have to have thrombosis. I could be living the dream. DIC, C for coagulation, but we have coagulation and then bleeding at the same time. We call this thrombohemorrhagic disorder. Truth number four, no single blood test whatsoever can confirm or rule out the diagnosis of DIC. So just because d dimer has high, this does not confirm the diagnosis, so shut up. DIC, normal fibrosal level can exclude. No, 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 I have told you, no single blood test can confirm or rule out the diagnosis. It ain't gonna happen, baby. Now, these are the two cases that I gave you in the beginning of the video, absolutely crucial. So, this is the patient, day one, septic shock, day two, ARDS, day three, DIC. Please remember this. The other case, pregnancy, abrupt placenta, labor, amniotic fluid embolism with dyspnea, cyanosis, hypotensive shock, seizure, pulmonary edema, and then DIC. Why? I've told you because of the tissue factor. Fibrolysis has two subtypes, primary fibrolysis and secondary fibrolysis. Which one is DIC? Let me know the answer in the comment section. This is what happens. You start with a bacterial infection, sepsis, and then sepsis will secrete TNF and interleukin-1, which will cause DIC, hypertensive shock, and metabolic abnormalities. All of these together is a septic shock. Remember your SIRS criteria. And then sepsis will secrete CSF. This is not your cerebrospinal fluid. Get your head out of your sphincter. This is the colony stimulating factor because it's stimulating the bone marrow to cause leukocytosis. And that's why in sepsis, it's not uncommon to find High white blood cell count. Sepsis will secrete interleukin-6. Go to the liver. CRP, C-reactive protein. So CRP will be high. Of course, ESR can be high. These cytokines will go to the hypothalamus and reset your thermostat. Will lead to prostaglandin fever, 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 fever. That's why you get fever. Pain and inflammation. Remember the prostaglandins. And that's why steroids are anti-inflammatory. Steroids will knock off the prostaglandins. Steroid will inhibit the interleukin-1 specifically interleukin-1 beta, and that's why steroids are famous. Because even if the doctor does not fully understand the pathophysiology of the disease, if they give you steroids, in many cases you'll improve. And you see this today with COVID-19. Some patients actually respond to dexamethasone, even though we do not actually understand the actual specific sophisticated pathogenesis, at least one of the prostaglandins or the cytokines are involved and steroids will knock them off. But of course, steroids can also increase your risk of infection because there are no solutions in life. There are only trade-offs. Disorders of hemostasis are divided into three categories. Disorders where I bleed, disorders where I clot, disorders where I bleed and clot, the thrombohemorrhagic disorder such as DIC. Let's talk about hypercoagulability. Now this is thrombophilia, not thrombocytosis. This is thrombophilia, baby. The Faircose triad. We have primary causes and secondary causes. DIC is here. Now here is a good question for you. Can someone tell me why does nephrotic syndrome cause hypercoagulability? My dear fellows, please do not get it twisted. DIC has two subtypes. Acute decompensated DIC, which is today's topic. This is the bad, horrible, severe DIC. And then we have chronic compensated DIC. I'll tell you the difference in the next video. DIC, who pulled the trigger? Who started all of this nasty activation of the coagulation cascade and then consumption of the coagulation factors and the platelets and fibrinolysis and then bleeding? Who did this? Could be obstetric complications acute promyelocytic leukemia if you have watched my hematology playlist, tumors, especially advanced one, trauma, sepsis, snake bite, and acute pancreatitis. Because remember, the amniotic fluid embolism can release the tissue factor. Acute pancreatitis, the pancreas has bazillion enzymes. They could trigger the DIC. Snake bite has venom, which can trigger the DIC. Sepsis with its interleukin and prostaglandin and all of this nasty stuff can trigger the DIC. Tumor will trigger it with a TNF. Look at the name, tumor necrosis factor. I mean, if you are not going to coagulate when there is necrosis, when the flip are you ever going to coagulate? And that's why when you die, your blood will clot. It's just one of the reasons. How do snakes kill you? First, constriction is possible. They can wrap themselves all around your butt and suffocate you, or they can secrete venoms. There are bazillion types of venoms. I'll just tell you about two. We have the neurotoxin secreted by the corral snake, and we have the hemotoxin 
so created by the rattlesnake or the viper. Now, which one of these two will trigger the DIC? Since DIC is a subject in hematology, of course, it's the hemophreaking toxin, the rattlesnake. And I hereby declare you a snake expert. You should start your own show on Netflix and call it Snake King. My goodness, people have lost it. If you remember my video about AML, M3 subtype, also known as APML, acute promyelocytic leukemia, it had DIC. You can still get 25% discount towards my antibiotics course available for five students only. Go to medicosisperfectionalist.com, use the promo code antibiotics25. DIC is a consumptive coagulopathy. My goodness, I love this word. Coagulation will lead to consumption of platelets and coagulation factor, and then you have increased activation of fibrinolysis, and then you bleed. Consumptive coagulopathy, and then you bleed. DIC is a problem with primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, and fibrinolysis. You bleed from every orifice, you bleed from every wound, you bleed from every scratch. No single blood test can confirm or rule out the diagnosis. The closest that you can get is when you have a negative D-dimer. This may, to a certain extent, rule out DIC although the negative predictive value is not 100%. Now, please do not be that doofus who say, hey, nurse, please, I've just diagnosed this patient with DIC, now I can go home. Grandma will tell you, come here, big boy. First, you need to diagnose and specify the underlying cause, because unless you stop and treat the underlying cause, the DIC is not going anywhere, doofus. DIC causes obstetric complications, APML, sepsis, snake bite, tumor, trauma, acute pancreatitis, pathophys, activation of the tissue phospholipid or tissue factor or factor 3 or tissue thromboplastin, which will increase coagulation and thrombosis. Also, there is activation of TPA, which will activate plasminogen into plasmin, fibrinolysis, and then bleeding. Thrombosis plus bleeding equals thrombo, hemorrhagic disorder. I bleed from every orifice, I bleed from every wound, I bleed from every scratch. But it count is low because the platelets has, have been consumed in the stupid fibrin thrombus. Bleeding time is prolonged, schistocytes are common, PT is high, extrinsic is abnormal, PTT is high, intrinsic is abnormal, TT is also prolonged, the common pathway is defective. Both D-dimer and fibrin degradation products are prolonged because of the overactivation of fibrinolysis. Coagulation factors are low, you have successfully consumed them. Fibrinogen level in the serum is low because it's one of the fa coagulation factors. Fibrinogen was factor one, if you remember. How do I treat DIC? You need to treat the underlying cause first. Give fresh frozen plasma to replace the coagulation factors. If it's really, really severe and acute bleeding, or if you're preparing the patient for an emergency surgery, you can transfuse platelets. You might give cryoprecipitate to replace fibrinogen mainly. DIC baby, how about platelet count? Low, bleeding time, prolonged, PT and PTT, prolonged, D-dimer, prolonged, fibrin degradation products, prolonged, fibrinogen degradation products, prolonged. From Picmonic, DIC, look at the dice, what are the triggers? Snake bite, trauma, obstetric complications, acute pancreatitis, tumor man, nephrotic syndrome, even blood transfusion can trigger a DIC. For more visual mnemonics, go to picmonic.com slash VIP hookup slash medicosis. Today's question is here. Please let me know the answer in the comment section. You'll find the correct answer in the next video. Please subscribe, hit the bell and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to get my antibiotics course. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy and study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.